joining us. This is just such a treat for us. And you have so much I know that you're going to be sharing with us. Um, Laura has done really, it seems like just about everything from her symphony orchestra playing, ballet orchestra playing. Um, she, she's teaching um, and she specializes in uh, Bach and teaching Bach. So um, she was the original harpist with Wicked on Broadway. So she certainly had her share of Broadway. And after many years of a professional career and living in the New York area, she is currently living in Miami where she is teaching privately in person and on Zoom. So I'm sure I'm leaving out many, many things that you, other things that you have done, but uh, certainly I don't wanna take too much away from what you wanna discuss with us today, which is a new publication for intermediate playing uh, based on box music. So I'm gonna let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you. Um... Thank you, Kimberly, and also again, thank you, Mary, for inviting me. It's such an honor. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is really tremendous. I'm so touched to see so many people from so many different places. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to do a little PowerPoint to, to, um, to kind of keep myself organized um, and, and do some playing as well today. So um, what uh, Mary came up with some fantastic questions that she had asked for, uh, for me to discuss today. Um, so it's going to be exploring phrasing and tone quality in box music on the heart. Now, while phrasing and tone quality sound like they're two separate topics, and indeed they are, but they're actually very close, closely related. And I hope by the end of today's talk, um, you might be convinced of that as well, too. So um, I'm going to start by uh, being from a very basic level, like sort of like how I would teach these topics um, and then move on from there and do some demonstrations as well. Okay. Okay, so let's just start, like, what is a phrase? Okay, so I like to use language when I talk about uh, phrasing. I'm certainly not the first person to do this. <laughs> a lot of people use that analogy of language to music, um, but I just find that it's, it's just really useful to do. So with language, of course, uh, when we wanna try to convey our message to express something, we have sentences, and often those sentences have punctuation, um, you know, commas, periods, question marks, and then we combine a bunch of sentences together, right, to create paragraphs. Okay, it's the same thing in music, right? Um, we have the phrases, and we can have what I like to think of as kind of punctuation at the end um, of these, and then we can put different phrases together in order to, to create a paragraph. So everybody knows Mary had a little lamb, so I'm just gonna, gonna use this example. Um, I love colors, so you can see there, there are colors here to help to demonstrate. The, the phrases are in blue, so you can see in Mary Had a Little Lamb, just the first two lines, we have two phrases, okay? So, of course, let me play it. So we have two phrases there. Now, how do I know that we have two phrases there? Two things. The first is we have a type of a cadence, right? So at the end of the, the last line, we have what's called a 5-1 cadence, a dominant cadence to a tonic, and that's outlined in red. It has the brackets around the red. The... But even though 5-1 is a strong cadence, that doesn't sound like the piece ended, right? And one reason why it doesn't is because the melody goes up. So we have a weak cadence or an open cadence, but definitely we come to kind of like the end of something. It's like it would be either a comma in language or a question mark, right? We know that we need to go on, okay? And then with the second phrase, uh, it ends uh, as a... So we do have, again, again, another 5-1 cadence. It's a strong cadence and the melody now goes, it goes down, it feels complete, okay? So just like language, we have phrases they use punctuation either through cadences or through some kind of um, melodic um, endings, right? Um, so that's what a phrase is, but why is a phrase important, okay? So like in language, we need, we need to articulate our, uh, what we're trying to say, what we're trying to express, right? So we can shape the music so that it's understandable. 
Okay, and uh, there are three ways when I teach uh, how to phrase music, there are three ways that we can do that. Uh, it's not specifically harp uh, related to the harp, it's for everything, but um, we can use dynamics, right? We're gonna talk about each one of these individually. We can use rhythm and we can use tonal variations. So you see how I have that in quotation marks. That's the topic for the second half of this presentation. And again, I'm gonna explore why it's related to phrasing, right? So let's just uh, quickly go through, uh, well, let's do this first. Um, I'm going to go through dynamics, rhythm, and tonal variations in just a second. But now that we know what a phrase is, um, we're going to explore how do I know when a phrase begins and ends. Phrases begin at the beginning, right? Or after one phrase is completed, another phrase it happens. That, that's pretty clear. Um, you know, after some kind of musical punctuation, as we talked about, which, which is like a type of cadence or a, a melodic conclusion. So the Mary Had a Little Lamb, that's melody and accompaniment. Right? And think about the music that you usually play on the harp. A lot of it is right hand does the melody, left hand does some kind of accompaniment. So it's pretty clear. It can be clearer, actually, to determine phrases because everything's nice and neat. Right? I'm not saying that box music is messy, but it's a different style of, of music. It's what's called contrapuntal music. So instead of having one melody that pri that's primarily played in the right hand, he has multiple melodies going on at the same time. So contrapuntal music is multiple melodies at once. Sometimes the right hand plays it, sometimes the left hand plays it. Sometimes there are two that are playing at the same time and we need to determine which one is like the primary melody. Okay, so it's a little bit more challenging. It's a little bit trickier, but it's really a lot of fun to explore. Um, so, but we need to figure out like, where are these phrases in box music? Because as everybody knows, like there are a lot of notes in box music, a lot of 16th notes, and it's not always clear. Right. So one of the I teach a lot of Bach. I teach actually a, a graduate seminar and it's called Bach for Performers. Um, and it's for musicians of all, all kinds, the instrumentalists, vocalists, choral conductors, orchestra conductors, and everybody picks a piece of Bach and they transcribe it for their instrument or vocal type or for ensemble. Right. And, and so a lot of these things that I'm talking about today are some of the like tips that I, I uh, I share with them. So in box music, very he uses rests as clues, like quarter rests, sixteenth rests, as clues to his music. Very often he'll even start his pieces on a rest, which sounds strange, right? Why are you going to start on a rest at the very beginning of a piece? But he does that, and he's very consistent with that um, frequently. And we're going to look at at two cases, two instances of that as a second. So that's going to be a hint, a kind of a clue and where the phrasing is. I'm not saying that every single phrase starts with a rest, but he does it really frequently enough that you can kind of, kind of point, um, pinpoint that there. Um, another way to determine phrasing in box music is with melodic patterns. Um, and in fact, let me go ahead and play this second example. Um, so this is BWV 927. And the reason why I use the BWV um, numbers to, to identify pieces is that you see this piece is called Prelude in F Major. Well, he probably has like dozens of Preludes in F Major, but there's only one BWV number for each piece. So we can be very specific about, about what this is. So this is a new, in a, or uh, new to me, but this is an intermediate piece. Um, I have a new collection. Um, it's called uh, Bach for All Harpists. And um, it's for beginning to advanced, actually. Um, and it's for, uh, pedal harp, and there are actually two, two pieces in here that are good for lever harp as well. Um, so this is one of the intermediate pieces, and um, I'm going to play the first two phrases just to illustrate, like to, to get us into how do we determine phrases in box music, you know, where are they, and how do, how do we shape them, okay? So uh, let me just, you'll see again the phrases are in blue, and I'm just going to play the first two, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, Hint, look at that. Even though we have a downbeat in the left hand, he starts the melodic material with a rest. Again, this is typical Bach. It's a lot of fun. So. Okay. So we have these two phrases. Um, 
it's a little bit like the melody and accompaniment that we have in, in traditional non-contrapuntal music. So this is, again, this is more like intermediate. We're not in a deep dive of contrapuntal writing yet. So we're going to get to there in just a second. So we have a mo more or less melodic material in the right hand and with the left hand, right? But you'll notice that it's starting in the second phrase, he switches hands, right? So now the right hand does the, does the accompanimental period, the accompanimental uh, material in the right hand where the left hand, right? So he switches hands, okay? So he's just playing with that um, and there's a little bit of uh, transitional material in between. Okay, so this is like putting our, our baby toe, I guess you say, into the, the counterpoint water, <laughs> um, you know, in that we're developing both hands, okay? So you can see very clearly two phrases um, and then, so what I would do is I'm going to, I would phrase to the top, to the climax of the first phrase, which is um, the third beat of the second bar. So, um, um, um. that's where the, the climax of that phrase is. And then you come down. Okay. So that's how I would phrase that. And I might even take a little bit of time with it too. So I would use dynamics and I would use time in order to phrase that. And then with the second phrase, I would do the same exact thing. Okay. Now you'll see also in my chart, I say where to breathe, like phrasing in box music, where to breathe. That's the number one complaint I get from all instrumentalists is where do I include time? Where do I breathe? And if it's an instrument like the flute or a clarinet or something, they literally, and, and voices, uh, the vocal the vocalists, they literally say, I don't know where to breathe. So that's one reason why it is so important to recognize phrases in box music, because only then can you determine where you're going to breathe, where you're going to take time. And this music absolutely requires uh, time and breath, because otherwise it is going to sound like a typewriter or perpetual motion or a metronome. And that's not box music that's I mean it's his music but it's not being played in, an, in, a, in a moving way right that's just playing the notes all right so those are some specifics about playing box music um, on the harp okay so now we're going to get a little bit more into the contrapuntal music by talking about a fugue okay there are some harpists in the world who say that fugues are not possible to play on the harp it broke my heart the first time I heard somebody say that. <laughs> um, it, for me, playing fugues on the harp is one of the greatest joys. My, one of my greatest musical joys is to be able to do that. And this one, the fugue in E-flat major, comes from BWV 998, which is it's a three-movement work, prelude, fugue, and allegro. So this is the central movement. Um, it was originally written, it's sometimes classified as a lute suite. Um, it, but also there are people who think that it might have been written for what's called a lute harpsichord. So you can imagine like a harpsichord, but instead of having the, the steel strings, they use gut strings just like we do. And it was um, meant to simulate the sound of a lute because this piece, practically speaking, isn't really playable well on a lute. Um, fortunately for us, it sounds really, really great on the harp. OK, so we're going to talk about phrasing in more densely contrapuntal music. So fugues are the densest you're gonna get with counterpoint. And again, I love it because it just offers so many wonderful challenges to navigate, especially on our harp, okay? So we have our fugue subject. Again, all the phrasing, in this case, the fugues are, are labeled in blue. Um, the first thing you might notice, again, he starts with a quarter rest. Okay, so now I want to talk about why that's significant and how I'm going to phrase it, right? We had talked about in 4-4, four, four, right? We have strong beats and weak beats. Downbeat, super strong, right? That's a downbeat. Second beat's weak. Third beat is strong, not as strong as the first, but so it's strong, weak, strong, weak, and then the next downbeat, right? So I'm going to phrase this subject I'm not going to play the first note as if it's a downbeat. I'm going to play it a little bit more softly, but I'm going to phrase that line to the set, the downbeat of the second measure. So if I play this, like I'm going to try to play it evenly. You know, that's not pretty. That's not expressive. I have no idea 
what the meter is, you know, we need to always articulate what the meter is because that's what makes the music come off the page. It what makes the music dance, right? So instead of making every single note exactly the same, like we don't talk like that, right? We, we inflect, right? We use strong and weak with our words. We're gonna do that also with this. I'm gonna start on the weak beat and I'm gonna phrase this to, this, to the second measure down beat, okay? So. All right, so that's how I would phrase that. Starts on a rest, right? So the fugue starts on a weak beat, phrase it to that next down beat. And every single time that the few comes in, I'm going to phrase it the same way, right? So we see that it starts in the right hand. Now, when we talk about box music, we, instead of saying right hand, left hand, because our hands are going to be all over the place, we're going to talk about voices, like soprano voice, tenor, alto. You know, voices just means what range it's in. So this is starting, I'm just going to call it the soprano range. It's a little low for the vocal, I think, soprano, but it starts in this range here. <laughs> Right? And it starts on the tonic, on E flat. You'll see in number two in blue, when, uh, when it comes in the second time, it starts on the dominant, on the fifth scale degree, and the B flat. Right? And then uh, at the very end of this example, number three, again, it's back in the tonic, but in a lower range. Now we're in the uh, tenor range. And later on in the piece, it actually comes in in the very, very low. It sounds fantastic on the harp so it comes in in the bass register okay so now we have the fugue we get to hear the fugue by itself Bach says okay here it is this is what what he's gonna explore all throughout this entire piece but the second time the fugue comes in when it starts in the dominant he has some counterpoint some little noodling melodic noodling <laughs> above that which we're not going to play as loud right So in third and fourth measure, we have that little counterpoint that goes, goes along with it. Then he does a little transitional material before he brings in the third instance. So let me just play all of this. I'm going to play the entire exposition of the fugue at the end of today's presentation. But let me just play this for you so that you can hopefully always hear the fugue subject when it comes in. And just listen to how I phrase it. of this, the few subjects. So hopefully you're able to hear the subjects each time. So that means I'm going to bring it out. I'm going to phrase it and I'm going to bring it out whenever it comes in and whatever is accompanying it, the melodic material, it, you play it a little bit less. You might have noticed in the transitional material, I kind of play along. I play with each voice there. I phrase them separately. Um, so um, so th those are just some ideas about how to phrase more contrapuntal music, which of course Bach, again, is the epitome of it. Um, you know, he was a late Baroque German composer. And by the time he was doing his greatest contrapuntal music, he was actually out of fashion. People would make fun of him and they would, they would complain that they were taking away all their fun, you know, um, because he wrote, every, he wrote most everything out. Um, but he really is the absolute pinnacle of late Baroque contrapuntal playing. So, um, okay, so we've talked about phrasing it kind of in a general con concept, but now I want to talk about uh, specifically with our wonderful instrument, the harp. Okay, so again, to shape a phrase, we articulate a beginning, a middle, or a high point, and then an ending. And as we discussed already, we can do this through dynamics, rhythm, and tone quality. So I'm going to preface this by saying dynamics. We're not talking romantic dynamics with like triple forte to triple pianos. Everything is more subtle and it's more about contrasts than it is about drama. Okay, save the drama for your romantic repertoire. It's absolutely appropriate. Um, this is just more about the subtleties of dynamics. So um, you probably know that in box music, there are not a lot of um, uh, dynamic markings written in his music. That was completely normal at the time. Think about it, this is pre-internet, pre-airplane travels. Like there was a community of musicians that came together. They played together all the time. They had a shared, they were educated in the same ways. They had a shared body of knowledge. They were either playing together in the church 
or, or for royalty. Um, Bach did start like a chamber music series, but that was like really kind of a new thing to do in the coffee house. Um, so they all knew each other and they knew the conventions at the time. So it was a waste of time to just, they didn't need to include a lot of dynamic marking. So we need to interpret that and figure out what the dynamics are. And very often it's where are the phrases and where are repetitions? If you have exact repetitions, you would do different dynamics. You would have a nice contrast. That's what was expected of the time. And again, nothing dramatic, everything pretty, um, you know, more on the subtle level than the drama. Okay, so you're not going to see hairpins in box music. I added them in this first example because I just wanted to show you the motion of how I'm phrasing it with the arrows, right? I'm going to that downbeat on, on bar two and then I'm coming away from it, right? And with that motion, I'm also going to have a little bit of the hairpin, which I played, uh, meaning the de crescendo, de crescendo, which I played previously. And again, with rhythm, he starts with a rest on beat one, so you're going to phrase it to that next downbeat, and then that feeling of being in two is so important. Even if it's not a dance movement, we want to have that groove. I call it a groove. I know that some people might, you know, that's more of like a jazz term, but that's what it is. It's like the drummer in the back, you know, keeping time while everybody does their improvisation above it. Um, that's not exactly what we're doing, but we have to have some kind of a groove going so that we can have rhythmic flexibility on top of it. If one and three is always in the same place, that music just comes off the page. You are gonna communicate, you're gonna be so successful in sharing your interpretation of this music with your audience if you have that. It doesn't mean it should be a metronome because you can wiggle around with the robot, little teeny teeny types of robotos and, and flow changes within those, the big beats, okay? Um, but it's just really, really important to sense the meter. I cannot stress that enough, especially in the bigger beats, okay? Um, so the third thing is tone quality, which is gonna be the second half of this, this talk uh, coming up in just a couple of minutes. Um, and it, of course, tone quality is what makes the harp so very special. It's one of my dearest, dearest topics that I love so much. Um, but before that, just a little remember that when you're playing the um, playing music, every note we play is either coming from a note or going to another note. In a phrase, no note exists by itself. You know, if you have rest on either side, yes, but you, you understand what I'm saying, that there has to be that sense of flow because music is always moving. It's always going somewhere or it's coming from somewhere. And the way that we do that again is using dynamics, rhythm, or tone quality. Okay, so tone quality. <laughs> Topic two is tone quality. So first of all, um, as I um, the harp is so special, as I said, because we create the magics in the fingers. The magics in our fingers. We don't have breath. We don't have a bow. We don't have keys like keyboards, right? We get the sound qualities out of our fingers, and there are seemingly infinite subtle ways that we can create tones with our fingers. That's what I mean by tone quality, right? When we start, like I said before, when you start the harp, it's hard, like the technique, how do I do it? How do I close my hands? But all along, we should be developing not only the ability to play with different tones, which we're gonna talk about, but also I teach my students to constantly listen to themselves. I'm teaching them how to hear the different tone qualities from a very early age. No banging out the top notes with me, mm -mm, never. Like you just can't from an early age, you know, um, just always that attention to tone quality. It is so important, why? Because it helps us to phrase. Again, we're not gonna use one color. We don't, there are different syllables and words. We don't talk like this, right? We inflect with our syllables. We, the tone of our voice, oh my goodness, how like if you use the wrong tone of voice with a, friend or loved one, how it can ruin a conversation, right? It's the same thing with the tone qualities. We have all these subtleties that we can put into it, okay? So that's why, that's why it's important. It's very, very expressive, and we're so fortunate to be able to do it with no intermediary. It's just our fingers on the string, all right? So how to produce a good tone. 
I had teachers from both lineages, from Salzedo was my first teacher, she studied with him, Salzedo wasn't, my teacher studied with Salzedo, very first one, and then the next three teachers I had all studied with Mr. Grajani. So I feel like I'm very fortunate because I come from two, two different worlds. Um, if you're more, if you're interested in even more information about this, I co-wrote an article with Sarah Cutler, the harpist with the New York City Ballet, who just retired. Um, it's called Suppleness, which I'm going to talk about in a second, and it's in the American Harp Journal. It's just a couple issues ago. Um, so if you want to read more about how both the Salzedo line and the French line from Renier. Um, all the way up to Grage and beyond, how really they're all talking about the same thing. They just use different words and sometimes different gestures or different actions to do it, but they're all talking about the same things. And that is tone quality is important and how you get a good tone quality it is, is important. And that's what I'm gonna talk about right now. So I'm sure everybody knows to get a good sound on the harp, we have to press on the string, right? <laughs> We close our hand fully, and then there's some kind of release of that tension, right? So press, close, release. Now, the French style, Renier on up, is it, it involves sometimes with like a more of a wrist action, right? So you're gonna release all that by a little bit of the wrist going back. Um, Salzedo, it's the fulcrum is in the elbow, right? So you release as you go out this way. But both of them are saying the same things. You put pressure on the strings, you engage the strings. I've had pictures that people have taken and you could like you could see, I'm getting ready to play that octave and you could see how I'm engaging, engaging that octave. Even if I'm playing a piano, if I'm playing softly, right? I'm still really pulling or pressing on the, pulling's the wrong word, <laughs> bad teacher pressing on the string you know, to really get that good sound because you have to engage a string i like to say sometimes in a loving way like you know patting a baby's tail butt or excuse me but or like kneading dough uh they say in europe they say pizza dough right or you know whatever analogy you want but you have to engage a string you have to close the hands but as you know as teachers you could the you see students who close their hands all the time they're still tense they just keep them in the follow through. They don't get the relaxing part. That's hard. It's very hard for students to get. But again, I try to start from the beginning. So press, close, and some kind of release. That's where we get the basics of producing a good uh, sound on the harp, a warm sound. And then that's just the start because we can do different articulations as well. Like Renier in her method book, first of all, on page one of Renier's method book, she says, tension is the enemy of a good sound. So from the very first lesson for her, she's already talking about release the tension, <laughs> do something to get rid of the sound, the follow through, right? That is instrumental. That's part three of how to get a good sound, right? Um, so, but she also talks about different types of articulation. Like she says, long, short, me long, medium, and short, like short would be just like some kind of staccato, like a short kind of, Kind of sound and then you can do medium and long a long one would be more for legato which is really useful when we're phrasing okay so there's just like so many subtleties of tone quality and that affects our articulations as well um, i'm reminded i i play with florida grand opera and we're currently doing bohem and you probably if you've seen any of puccini's parts he's very specific about even in the heart part uh you know what articulation to use? Is it a tenuto? Is it an accent? Uh, sustain? Um, at one point, he, he uses the word vibrato. I'm really not sure why he uses vibrato. I talked to the conductor about it, and it's the moment when Mimi's getting ready to die, and those long, those low, low A flats. He's like, just play like death. <laughs> so, but you know, Puccini's very specific. Bach, no, he doesn't. He doesn't put a lot of extra musical marks again. Uh, because the entire community had a shared convention, shared knowledge about how music was performed at that time, right? But once we get the basics down of how to produce a tone quality, then you can experiment with all the different varieties of staccatos and legatos and accents, tenutos, everything in between. And all of those different subtleties help us with our phrasing. And it is an absolute joy to be able to play diverse tones and articulations on the harp. 
Um, you may know, uh, you know, Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist. So he has three separate recordings of the Bach cello suites. Like he didn't just do one, so that's it, I'm done, definitive recording. He's like still experimenting, like, no, let, let me try it this way. Let's do it that way. And that's why one reason why box music is so great because there's no one right way to play it. And you can, it's like lifetime music. You know, you can play it from the very beginning. You could play it all the way to, to like you're a professional for 40, 50, 60 years and, and still be getting um, variety and enjoyment from it and also communicating your interpretations to audiences. So tone quality is a huge uh, passion of mine and I'm, um, I'm as you can see, <laughs> uh, something that I, again, I always talk to my students from a very early age, not just the technique itself, but how to produce a really good sound, good's a bad word, a, a consistently good sound, for lack of a better word, but also diverse sounds and getting different articulations as well. Okay, so I think, uh, before I play the fugue, whoops, um, exposition, just a quick, like, why? <laughs> I get this question a lot. Um, so naturally Bach didn't write any music for our instrument. There, this, this harp, of course, is the pedal harp didn't exist during Bach's time. There were harps that did exist, but his music's really chromatic and none of the harps at that time were easily chromatic. You know, you have the double and triple, but he, and he, which did play chromatic music, but anyway, he didn't write for the instrument. But as I said before, I think box music is for everybody. Um, and these are some of the reasons why I think it's really good for harpists and especially good for harpists to learn from an early age, right? So we talked about it, it develops our technique. It's equally challenging in both hands, right? It helps to develop our contrapuntal hearing and playing, which you can use for all types of harp music. This is not just like, oh, I learned this and I'm only going to use it for Bach. You're going to use this. It enriches all of your repertoire. Okay, it develops your pedal technique. Um, if you're a lever harpist, it develops your lever technique. If you don't know Anne Marie O'Farrell, the Irish harpist, look on YouTube for her chromatic fantasy. She plays it on the lever harp. It is brilliant. I am co-presenting with her and doing a joint recital at the American Harp Society's conference in Orlando in June. And uh, she's going to talk about box music on the harp, on the lever harp, and I'm going to talk about it from the pedal harp perspective. And she is brilliant. So box music is absolutely um, possible to do on the lever harp. And she's even invented a new type of notation that that more clearly illustrates how to, to change the levers in, in highly chromatic music. So. Um, I, I highly recommend you check her out. She's, she's fantastic. But for the pedal harp, it definitely uh, develops your pedal technique. Um, it refines your muffling technique. You know, this the harp's a very resonant instrument. It's one of the magical things about it, but box music's really contrapuntal. There can be a clash there, meaning like it could sound really muddy sometimes. So um, I use a lot of different types of muffling techniques. We don't need to go into these today. I do put, I include them in my additions. Um, I include information about the different types of muffling techniques. Um, number five, you learn conventional melodic patterns, especially left-hand cadences, like stuff that you'll use forever in any kind of Baroque music. Um, they're usually tricky for beginner or intermediate, but once they get it, they just, whoosh, they just fly. Like they just, they always know it for the next one. And it's really a beautiful thing to witness. Um, also because ornamentation and the spirit of improvisation is so important in box music, we, we get introduced to that. And again, I give a lot of information about that in all of my editions. We're not gonna go into it today. And lastly, one of my all time favorite things is like the rhythmic groove of contrapuntal music. Again, I don't want anybody ever coming up to any of you saying, oh, Box music sounds, you know, sounds like a typewriter or it sounds like a metronome. Like, no, absolutely not. This music dances. His music dances, whether it's a dance or not, it should come off the page. It should dance. It should be toe tapping. <laughs> you know, um, it, it just, it comes alive once we're able to do the rhythmic groove, which again is like feeling everything in the big beats as opposed to getting bogged down into the, the individual quarter notes or 16th notes. Okay, so those are some reasons why I think that box music is um, important for harpists. And what I would like to do now is I'm just going to play the exposition of this few. <coughs> okay, so just from from the beginning. So. Thank you. 
subjects, four entrances of the subjects in the different ranges. Hopefully I was successful and hopefully Zoom allowed me to do that. I'm always concerned about that. But that's that's just a, the very beginning of, of the fugue um, of BWV 998. So is this might this be a good time for questions, do you think? I think this is a great time for questions. Thank you so much. I mean, this is really great information. And I know, especially this time of year with my studio and recital, spring recital coming up, we're trying to get past a little bit, just learning the notes and really have those musical experiences. And, and just, I appreciate in your, in your music that you were showing is the, that you had the phrase markings there to really bring that out, especially for younger students or less advanced students. So um, we do have a, a question in the chat, but uh, there are, are there any Bach harp duet books? And I don't know if um, Mary might also be able to chime in on this question, but Laura, do you know any Bach duet books? I don't, that's a fantastic, um, that would be a great teaching tool. Yeah, I would look on Harp Column Music. They they have a surprising, I say surprising, there are a lot of um, Bach transcriptions and arrangements on Harp Column Music. Um, so maybe there is one. Um, you know, I just did this article for them. It's a two part article for the uh, Harp Column Magazine about Bach. And I, I gave a little kind of summary. Of, it's not comprehensive, but of just some things. And I seem to remember there were a couple of duet ones, but check out Harp Column Music or just do a little Googling. That would be a great teaching tool as well as for performances too. And Mary, what about, do you, are you, do you have any a knowledge? I mean, I know they're out there and I know some of them are, are, there are Bach duets within collections of duet books as well, but can you think of anything specifically right now? I think that there are a bunch of Yezu Joy duets out there. I know Dewey Owens has one that I played like 45 years ago, <laughs> the, the Yezu Joy, and it's not bad. Um, on our website, if you go to early music, we've got early music PDFs and then early music solos. So you can look through that. I think that there are about 80 pieces in each category. So you might have to kind of scroll through, but we have a, a uh, if you use the coupon code Baroque, there's 15% off on all of our early music, uh, solo PDFs and paper, paper, paper music. And I'm thinking too of um, uh, Betty Perret's second harp book has one or two um, harp duet, Bach harp duets in that, in that book as well. Um, but speaking of uh, books, I know you've translated and edited several. Would you just, uh, I know it's on your website, which I love your website, busytuning.com. That is not one that is going to be easily forgotten. Um, but would you uh, just kind of share with us the uh, material that you have done and how it's available? Sure, sure. No, I appreciate you asking. Um, I started a publishing company back in 2012 and because for my doctoral dissertation, I transcribed all of Bach's lute suites for the harp and that was, I, I, I shopped it around all the uh, different um, harp publishing companies and, and everybody's like, Laura, that's a fantastic idea, but it's a lot of notes and it's never going to make any money. So I'm like, okay, I'll do it, <laughs> which was an education in itself, but I'm glad I did it. So again, that's like, um, Wow, 12 years ago already. And so I, not only do I have, I have the lute suites, I have preludes and fugues from the Well Tempered Clavier. Um, I have, uh, my lute suites look like this. And then um, this new collection that I have, the Bach for All Harpists from beginning um, through advanced. Um, so I do all the print editions of my Bach works. And then I've recently started collaborating with Harp Column Music. And you know they only handle PDF downloads, so a number of my pieces that you'll see on my website for the print editions they're also available as immediate instant PDF downloads on Harp Column Music. So you would just you know put my name into the search function or Bach or something, and they come up. So again, the Bach for All Harpists is available. I have nine intermediate pieces that I just did. They're all from the Well Tempered Clavier. Um, you know I'm really trying to focus on the pedagogical harp stuff so that teachers will have more information. Um, three of my intermediate pieces I just found out yesterday were um, included on the American Harp Society's 
competition list for 2025. Um, so I'm super excited about that. I think it's for the junior edition. And then there's an open box too. Um, so anyway, you can go to busy, busytuning.com, look for Gotham Heart Publishing, and, and this is there. Again, I handle all the prints and Heart Column Music handles all the PDFs. So I, I hope that helps. I also have a number of people I collaborate with. You can see here uh, other transcriptions of early music, Handel, um, you know, uh, the, the cello suites, Tori Drake, she did those for, for Gotham Heart Publishing. Um, so there's just a lot of, a lot of early music and I also commission contemporary composers. So I kind of handle early and, and current um, on, on my website. So, so that's that. Right. Well, congratulations for having some of your music chosen for American Harp Society competition. That's that's second. really that, that's going to be must be great to, to be able to see it acknowledged at, uh, with the association with the society. Yeah, I they this is the second time that my lute suites were or lutes the lute suites were um, on the rep list last year, and they actually invited me to be a judge. Uh, for the 2023. Um, so I, I'm just honored, you know, that they're including, including my music on the rep list. Right. Are, there, are there any more questions? I'm really happy to. Um, yes. And uh, Keila, thank you. Keila Walton has posted a link in the chat as well um, to uh, Melody's website, one of Betty Prey's books, Duos Plus which has a second harp part and uh, the other part can be played on with the harp, piano, or organ. So that gives us some additional material there. So Anne has asked if you have any tips for memorizing Bach. So that's a big one. Um, again, I, you know, I teach mostly college students and um, memorizing is probably one of the, once you get to the advanced level is one of the most, most difficult things. Um, I'm, I'm very much, stress score study away from the harp. Um, you know, you have to understand how the piece is put together before, you know, because there's so many notes, like we can't just be like, oh, this phrase, this phrase, you know, just knowing how it's put together. Um, you know, all the traditional techniques of like labeling different sections and starting like, I, you know, in the old days, we would have little note cards and say, you know, start at letter B, you know, from memory and knowing where your pedal diagrams are and all like that. So there's a lot of like traditional memorizing techniques, but I really think understanding how the piece is put together, like what tonal centers is he going to, you know, um, just digging deep into the theory of the piece, how the form, how it's organized, that helps. And just sheer repetition, because there are so many notes. When I did judge the competition last um, last summer, yeah, 2023, um, I was incredibly impressed by the young students' memorization skills. Like they just flew through a lot of this Bach, like it was, you know, not easy. Like it was easy. I could tell how much time and effort they put into it. In all honesty, I am not a natural memorizer. You know, I, I get very nervous if I have to, to play things from memory. It, some people have a very good facility with memory. I'm not one of them. So I feel your pain. I hate to call it pain, but it just takes a lot of work. For me, it takes a lot of work and a lot of repetition. Um, I hope that helps, but I, I definitely understand that it's a challenging it is a challenging a challenge and i think anytime you can apply some theory concepts ha, under, understanding and apply theory concepts and a lot of times if i don't if i don't have time to work strictly with theory aside i'm i'm trying to teach my students you know some of the theory applications right in the pieces because that sometimes that's the only way to get it in and that's the only way to really get those connections where they can work on the memorizing and all um, Timothy's asking in the fugue, how did you decide whether to play the quarter note line with raising or in a connected line? Oh, that's excellent. First of all, I should thank, I should thank Timothy. He was my second set of eyes on, on uh, the more advanced um, pieces in this collection. So thank you for that. I missed a couple of pedal changes. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I go back and forth. Like usually, and I think the way that as teachers we teach is like, if you want something legato, you connect it, right? I think most of us are probably trained that way. If you want it to sound detached, you don't connect. But sometimes I chicken out. And the reason I say this is that if I don't feel like I can get a clear enough line by having my hand a little bit stagnant. Oh, sorry. I, what are my. Uh, you know, like if I don't feel confident that I can get a, a 
real line, a real phrase by doing it, then I will, I feel like I have, I have a little bit more control, but I don't want it to sound staccato. So there's a danger when you come off after each note, it could sound detached. So I always go back, that's very good perception, Timothy. Um, I go back and forth. Ideally, when I teach my students, I'm like, no, connect it. And yeah, it, if I had complete confidence, I would do that all the time. But as I said, sometimes I chicken out and try to, I'm not gonna say cheat, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, Nancy. Nancy has her hand raised. Uh, let me see if I can figure out. Are I'm you off on mute? I'm, I'm off mute. And one of the books I love about Bach is um, the dances in the music of Bach. Have, are you aware of that? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so it's the... fun to read and it really does kind of give you a sense of the the culture and the joy of the dances in the music. You're talking about a printed book, like a book, not a, a music book. book. Yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. When I, I this back, graduate back course that I teach, we go into great detail about the dances. As it culturally you do, like you said, you do learn so much about it because in the dances, which are a key part of their culture, there are rhythmic tendencies that mm -hmm. we use, that we should use in the dance uh, movements that we play. The most obvious one that we learned when we were really young is the Cerebon you phrased B2. Right? Cerebons are in 3 4, but you put a little emphasis on the second beat. Why? Because that's the way the dance was constructed. So, absolutely, that's an excellent book. Um, that book is so fun to read. Mm -hmm. It's fun to read when you don't have a harp in your hands. Yeah. <laughs> there are recreations of Baroque dances online, too. I show those um, to my students in class as well. They're fun. Thank you. The, physical part of it, because it, again, it helps us with our phrasing. What's the name of the book? Um, do you remember, Nancy, the exact name? Dances in the, mu Dances in the Music of Bach. I'll put it in the chat. Thank you for sharing that. Cool. Um, hang on a second, let me get to my, I see little snippets of the chat. Okay, Laura, you reminded me of an importance of all aspects of music talents we learned. Oh, that's so nice, thank you. Yeah. You know, we, we, we want to be expressive, right? We want to get our musical, like, we come to this because we love music and we want to share it with others, right? So it's just finding those tools and concepts to help us do that successfully, which is exactly in tune with how it was in the Baroque period. The whole point of playing music in the Baroque period was to move your listeners. I mean, I could go into all that. They talked about rhetoric and, you know, affect and all these other concepts, philosophical concepts that they were talking about in music as well, right? They want you want to move your listeners. And again, we're not doing it in some grand romantic way that came later. It's all about the subtleties of it. And we do that with our fingers, right? Knowledge of what's going on on the page and then translate it through our fingers. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, uh, well, there will be a recording of this. Mary will be sending a follow-up for a link of recording is that right mary yeah i i will definitely i have a, I have a question though about fingering um laura um i have students that what is what is your rule for for fingering because i've got students that tr will try to put all their fingers on when they only need to have two on or they try to put all their fingers on and 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 they're they're not realizing that you know, you're supposed to put your fingers on going in one direction and it's counterproductive to put too many fingers on at one time. Absolutely. So yeah, I definitely come from the directional placing school of heart playing, like whatever direction you're going in, that's all that you put on. And I'm really particular about it because you could hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. you could absolutely hurt yourself if you try to do that. Like there's a story, I think it was List or somebody that he kept practicing like over and over and over, like on this side of their hand, you know, and, and got and injured himself. I can't, it was either Liss or I can't remember, one of, the, one of the pianists. So we don't want to injure ourselves. So directional placing is essential. You only place in the direction that you're going to, unless it's something that's really fast. You know, like, you know, then I'm going to put all four on, even though I'm going up, you know, like you're not going to go, eh, 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 like, no, you don't have time to do it. You know, then something like that, you would put them all on at the same time, but whenever possible, directional placing is essential to do for our hand health. 
in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And you don't, do, are, do your additions, do they have brackets and mm -hmm. fingerings in them as well? Yeah, they do. And especially for like what I've started doing, like with the intermediate, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, like I put more stuff in it, with the beginner and intermediate than I do for the advanced because there are different ways of doing it. Everybody has different shaped hands and we have to start people off somewhere. So I'm saying, look, this is a way I think you should do it, you know, but then like I gradually take all that away um, because hopefully the student is constantly learning what works best for their hand, you know, what's healthiest, what sounds the best, you know, as you get more developed, like late intermediate, um, early advanced. So I don't have, as I always include the paddles. And if there's something that I find like, there's really only one way to finger this, that's gonna work so you can get to the next section of time, then I will include fingerings, but I try to kind of weed them out and give more space on the page for the advanced ones. But yeah, yeah, I include like what's called a Bach primer, you know, um, you know, like how how to play his music about ornamentation and muffling articulation dynamics. I try to in every single edition, I kind of put a little synopsis. So it's like one stop shopping. I want to learn how to play Bach. OK, you know, this is this is a good start. You know what I mean? Like all of my editions have those in there. And that article, too, for the heart column that just came out as well. That it was a heart primer. So Bach primer. Well, I think it's it's wonderful. It's hugely helpful for the students and for the teachers <laughs> to be able to just have that there and not have to draw in all those brackets all the time. Um, <laughs> it, it's really helpful. And for, you know, if somebody is working on their own and they're not uh, working with a teacher, just to have, have those guidelines and see if they need to make any adjustments after that, you know, but to have something to start with, I think is so important. So can I, I you know, we're sort of getting towards the end. Would you mind if, like, in case people want to reach out, can I just share a slide that that shows like my contact information and all? Absolutely. That? Uh, whoop, it's the hang on the next one. It's thank you <laughs> and how to find me. So again, I'm on social media, busy tuning both Instagram and Facebook. My website's busytune.com. And again, my publications, the print editions come from me from Gotham Heart Publishing on my website, and then the PDFs are there. Um, so if, if, and I, as you can tell, I'm, you know, kind of passionate about all this. I feel fortunate to have had time to study all this my entire adult life and I love sharing it. Um, so if you have any questions whatsoever, do not hesitate, please email me. Um, I'm really happy to talk to anybody. And then the last thing, and I, uh, I hope I'm wondering if people would mind, I love doing like the big zoom selfie at the end, you know, just cause. I feel like I've been talking to a camera for an hour, which essentially I have, and, and it's just a sense of community that I'm so happy you all are here and you spent your time with me. And just like, if you don't mind, I'm just going to do a little screenshot um, uh, of us. And there are two pages of you all, so <laughs> I'm going to do two, if that's okay. Okay, so I'm going to say one, two, three, and then I'll do this twice, okay? So if you want to be seen, yay, all these happy faces. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, and let me go to the next page. <laughs> I don't want to leave anybody out. And if you want to be seen, if not, no worries. One, two, three. Oh, I'll do one more. One, two, three. <laughs> okay, thank, uh, thank you for indulging me. It just makes me happy because this is a wonderful community and um, I hate that feeling of just talking to people. So just- No, it, it's, it is a wonderful community. And uh, thank you again, Mary, for, for your vision with all this. Thank you to each and every one of you for taking some time out of your very busy days and, and joining us so that we, we can get some additional insights. Laura, your passion for this music is, is so obvious. And the fact that you are sharing with it, sharing all this with the harp community and adding to the repertoire that we can get our hands on. Uh, we're certainly so grateful for that. So Thank you for joining us and, and sharing everything. Um, we have our next uh, Harp Teacher Gathering is, I believe it's May 2nd. Is that right? Do I have the date right, Mary? I think that's right. Yes. And May, it's yeah, May Anna 2nd and three o'clock again. With Anna Dunwoody and Robin Gordon-Cartier. So they'll be talking about some of their favorite uh, repertoire to teach, but not just um, pieces. They're actually going to be talking about tips and approaches 
in that repertoire. So I'm always looking for new and fresh things and ideas. And so I'm excited to see what they're going to have to share with us. And we'll be announcing our summer dates very soon. So you can get those on your calendar as well. Otherwise, please watch for your emails as uh, Mary will be sending those out as reminders and registration updates. So thank you all so much. Mary, anything else? Um, I think that's all. Thank you all for coming. It was a very nice turnout. And uh, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, all our guests today. Thank you. Take thank care. you. See you Bye. next month. Bye. See you next month. Signing off now. Bye, everybody. Okay. Now it's not letting me leave. Uh it's oh. frozen. Maybe you can do it, Kimberly. It's wow, frozen. let's see.